Devontae Adams tells the Raiders he wants a trade. Big time receiver. Big time chemistry with Aaron Rodgers. He's just the type of player who could breathe some life into the Jets offense, right? I don't think the Jets trading for Devontae Adams is a slam dunk. And I'll explain why today on Locked On Jets. You are Locked On Jets, your daily New York Jets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome. This is the Locked On Jets podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It's Wednesday, October 2nd, 2024, and I'm your host, John B. from GangGreenNation.com. Thank you so much for making the show your first listener, first watch every day. Subscribe to this show for free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts so you'll get new episodes as soon as they're posted. If you enjoy the show and are listening on a podcast for us, please give it a five-star review. If you're watching on YouTube and enjoy the show, give this episode a big thumbs up. It helps us out. helps other Jets fans find the podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Place your first $5 bet and you'll get started with $200 in bonus pets guaranteed visit fanduel.com to get started today we have our weekly mailbag show each wednesday we try to do a mailbag with listener questions thanks to everybody who sent in questions our first question is about the news story of the day regarding the new york jets on tuesday although it wasn't really about the jets it's about Devonte adams our first question john Devonte adams wants a trade he's got a lot of chemistry with aaron Rodgers. they produce great results together the jets offense needs some help isn't this a logical guy the jets should go after and I think that at a certain price, it would make sense for the Jets to go after Devontae Adams. However, I don't think that this is like the slam dunk move it's being portrayed as in the national media. And that's not to say that like trading for Adams is a bad idea. It's not to say Adams would be a bad player. Adams would be a good player. It's not even to say Adams would be anything other than an upgrade. He would be an upgrade for the Jets. But you know, this is the way I look at it. In your passing game, typically your top two receivers are the guys who get most of the targets. And everybody else is kind of an afterthought. Now, the Jets' top two receivers right now are Garrett Wilson and Mike Williams. And they're kind of off to slow starts, but for reasons that are understandable and for reasons that I do not think will linger. You know, Garrett Wilson and Aaron Rodgers, not quite on the same page right now. But, you know, two months from now, don't you think these guys are going get, to get on target? I mean, really good receiver, you know, Aaron Rodgers, Hall of Fame quarterback. Of course, there are going to be some, some growing pains, especially with like a quarterback, with a quarterback like Rodgers, who's a bit unconventional. But I just feel like the, the chemistry will grow. People keep talking about the chemistry between Rodgers and Garrett being a major concern. I mean, chemistry develops over time. I, 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 can't, I Is Garrett Wilson, are Garrett Wilson and Aaron Rodgers going to have the same chemistry week 14 that they did week four? I don't think so. Mike Williams off to a bit of a slow start because he's recovering from an injury because the Jets have been lowering his snap count. And you've been seeing him get better every week. And this past week, you know, he played very well against the Denver Broncos. So you have a good one-two punch. Now, if you add Devontae Adams, your one-two punch goes from being Garrett Wilson, Mike Williams, to Devontae Adams, Garrett Wilson. Now, that's better. I don't think it's as much better as like people are making it out to be, though. I think I think people are acting like this is an enormous upgrade. I think Garrett Wilson, Mike Williams, in the long run, you know, maybe it hasn't been to that point yet, but in the long run, as Garrett develops more chemistry with Aaron, as Williams gets healthier, that's gonna be a very good one-two punch. I don't think you're gaining that much. I think you're gaining something. I don't think you're gaining that much. Uh, now that drops Mike Williams to your number three spot. He takes over the number three role over Alan Lazard. That's a big upgrade. But again, your number three receiver doesn't see that many targets. So when we're talking about the actual volume Williams is going to be seeing, I don't know that you're really, again, I don't know you're adding a ton of surplus production. Again, you know, if the Raiders are willing to give you Devontae Adams, this is worth it. I think the, the big impact of adding a Devontae Adams is that he kind of gives you Garrett Wilson injury insurance, because if Garrett Wilson gets injured, then your one, two is Devonte Adams, Mike Williams, versus if you don't make the trade and Garrett Wilson gets injured, um, then your one, two is Mike Williams, Alan Lazard. That's a big difference. That's insurance, but I don't know that you should, it's an insurance policy that makes sense unless you think you're a Super Bowl team right now. Cause if you don't think you're a Super Bowl team right now, you know, what's the point of buying that insurance? And based on what we've seen the first four weeks, I think it's difficult to argue the Jets look like a Super Bowl team right now. You know, I, I think I, I'd have a very different view of this if the Jets were three and one and they played toe to toe with San Francisco. And maybe Adams was the guy who could save you in, in case of an injury. Maybe Adams would be the guy who's the difference between you being a Super Bowl contender and not being a Super Bowl contender. I don't think like adding Devontae Adams takes you from not being a contender to a contender. And I, there are other aspects of this that, you know, are, are not favorable. His contract is just terrible. I mean, I, I don't think there's any other way to put it. So, it, depending on when you trade for him this year, uh, you'll take on about thirteen point between thirteen point five million and somewhere around eight 
eight and a half million dollars. That depends on when you trade for him. The, the, the deeper you get into the season, the less he counts against your cap because the Raiders are paying him for each game. So each game the Raiders pay him for is a game you don't have to pay him for. So his his cap number goes down the deeper, you, the closer you get to the trade deadline. Next year, though, his contract becomes very unfavorable. He has a cap number of thirty five point six four million next year and thirty six point six four in twenty twenty six. So that's a really big number. Now, none of it's guaranteed. So you could cut him, I guess, but then he's only like a half year rental. So you don't want to give up a lot for a half year rental. You don't want to give up for a guy with a contract that bad. The other option is the Jets could extend him and lower the cap number for next year. But then you're talking about extending a guy who's 32 years old for, and probably for multiple years. So all of this is to say that, you know, I don't think it has as big of an impact as people are making it out to have. And you're taking on a lot of risk. You know, you're, you're you're either paying this guy an enormous salary next year at thirty-five point six four million. You're cutting him, which makes this a you know, again a short-term rental, or you're giving him multi years in order to lower that that cap number for next year. You're gonna have to you're gonna have to give him a new contract, which will guarantee him multiple years at thirty-two years old. I and mean, if you look at the list of the last decade of receivers who stayed stars, you know, into their mid-thirties, it's a list of one player, Larry Fitzgerald. So. You, you get, you're pretty much guaranteed to get a pretty bad contract on Adams if you keep him, or if you cut him, you're not you're only you're paying for a couple of games. So look, I would not, I don't think the the impact is as big as people make it out to be. I think this is one of those things where NFL Network will go crazy, you know, Greenberg on ESPN will go crazy, the beat writers will go crazy because the Jets are adding a star. Because, because whenever the Jets add a big name, you know that that's it, it gets a ton of hype. Does it actually move the needle for this team? I, I don't know that it does, I, or at least I don't know that it does that would justify the price the Jets are going to pay. If the Raiders can give him for a five or a six, sure, sure, you'll take the upgrade. But I, I don't know that it's really worth this move for the Jets. I think if the Jets make a move, if the Jets are active at the trade deadline, it should be for a defensive lineman because this defensive line is hurting right now. It is. You know, right now you have one defensive end who can get to the quarterback. That's Will McDonald. And that has a residual effect on the rest of the defense because because McDonald's the only defensive end who get can, who can get to the quarterback, he's got to play a lot. And extending McDonald's playing time kills you with the run defense because Will McDonald cannot play the run at all. And then defensive tackle Quinn and Williams is your only good player. If Quinn and Williams gets injured, this defensive line's in a lot as much trouble as it's in now. This is a doomsday scenario for the defensive line if Quinn and Williams gets injured. So either a defensive tackle or a defensive end. That's where the resources should go. That has the multiplier effect. It's not going to be as exciting as, you know, re reigniting the Rodgers, Devontae Adams uh, connection. But I think it would have a bigger impact. You know, some, sometimes the, the moves that generate the most buzz aren't the moves that help you win the most. A move that would help really help the Jets win would be to target a defensive lineman in the, in the trade market. That's where the resources should go, in my opinion. Um, I, I think that of course, Devontae Adams was, would be a guy that I'd take. And of course, you know, it's possible he just has a resurgence under Rodgers and, and makes a big impact. But based on what we know now, I, I'm not sure that that's the case. And I think that there's every reason to believe that the Jets wide receiver situation will improve organically as we move through the season. And this just feels like one of the, I, I don't know, I, I feel like a lot of the rumors like this are like well, the classic like WFAN move, which is like you lost a game. So you think just throwing another big name in the mix is going to fix all your problems. The Jets' problems on offense go well beyond wide receiver. In fact, wide receiver is one of the areas where I'm least concerned uh, on this offense right now. I think there are there are other issues that you know that are, are holding this offense back. Um, I, again, I'm not against trading for Devontae Adams, but I think there's this perception out there that this is a must do for the Jets. If they do, everything will be fine. If they don't, it will all be ruined. I think it's more nuanced than that. And I don't think this is I, I, look. You certainly call the Raiders. You certainly gauge what they're interested in taking for Devontae Adams. But this is not a move that I think should be uh, necessarily be on the front burner for the New York Jets. Now, head here on the Lockdown Jets podcast, we'll talk about the other big topic around the New York Jets, the coaching staff. Lots of Jets fans unhappy with this coaching staff. We're getting some unfavorable comparisons uh, with other between Robert Sala and other Jets coaches of the past. We got a lot of questions about what's up with Sala. Let's dive, let's dive into them. Continuing here on this Wednesday mailbag edition of Lockdown Jets. This episode of Locked On Jets is brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is the best place to get real money sports action. With over 10 million members and billions of dollars in awarded winnings, Prize Picks has made daily fantasy sports accessible to all. You just pick more or less than on at least two players for a shot to win up to 100 times your cash. 
Run your game all season long on prize picks, and you can now win up to 100 times your money on prize picks with as little as four correct picks. Sign up today and get $50 instantly when you play $5. You don't even need to win to receive the $50 bonus. It's guaranteed. Do you think the Jets are going to hold Justin Jefferson to less than 83 and a half yards this week? Do you think Christian McCaffrey will run for more than 75 and a half yards? Cook up hot takes with your friends and win real money this football season when you and your crew run your game on prize picks download the app today and use code locked on nfl to get 50 dollars instantly after you play your first five dollar lineup again it's code locked on nfl it's one word with no space l-o-c-k-e-d-o-n-n-f-l on prize picks thank you so much for making locked on jets your first listener first watch every day big shout out to every day this is a daily podcast covering the new york jets we have new episodes each day through the week monday through friday Let's continue now with our weekly mailbag. Our next question is from Don, who says, I really don't believe Rodgers and even a trade for Devontae would overcome Salah's terrible coaching. I'm not for mid-year head coaching changes, but can you see Woody Johnson firing Salah and promoting Ulbrich before the season is lost? I would be very surprised just because um, I, I think it's actually like official Jets policy that they do not change the head coach in season. I mean, there are plenty of examples of situations where they knew they were going to fire the coach uh, i remember todd bowles it was it was it was made clear to him like as early as like mid-november in 2018 that he was not going to be returning the next year as head coach but they still waited to the end of the year in fact i even remember reading a story that like after the final game of the 2018 season the jets were going to wait till the monday after the game it was a sunday game the jets were going to wait till the next day and todd bowles it was something like todd bowles called up christopher johnson who was running the team at the time because woody johnson was in england Todd Bowles called him up and said, hey, let's get this over with. You're going to fire me, fire me. Um, I think the ultimate example, though, was uh, four years ago with Adam Gase. I mean, if the Jets didn't fire Adam Gase four years ago in season, I, they're never going to fire a coach in season. Uh, I just don't see it happening. You know, should it happen? I, I honestly don't know how good Ulbrich would be. I think that Salah has reached a point where it might be worth a shot just to see because I, I think I think the coaching level is so low on this team right now from the top that – you might just make I, I think that there are two situations where, where I think there are three situations where an in-season change makes sense. Um, one is a situation where you're, you've already been eliminated from the playoffs and you've got, you know, it's, it's just like, you know, you're going to make the change. So just get, get just get started on it. That way you can start talking to coaches out in the open. Uh, the second situation is when you know you've actually got a quality coach internally whom you think can straighten things out. And the third is when the coaching level is just so low that, you know what, you just rolled the dice and there's a decent chance that the replacement will do a better job. I, I think the Jets might be at that point, but I don't think they will because, you know, they just have never done it before, even in situations like the Adam Gase, like Adam Gase in 2020. I mean, my goodness, they're not going to fire that guy in season. They're never going to fire. I don't think they're ever going to fire a coach in season. So we'll see. Maybe I've jinxed Salah, but I don't think it's going to happen. Next question, is Robert Salah a worse head coach than Adam Gase? Gase managed, managed seven wins with a vastly inferior roster in 2019. When Salah managed seven wins in 2022 and 2023. Salah also quit on his own team last year, something Gase never did. Salah is terrible at every aspect of his job, and it's embarrassing that he's still the head coach of his team. So is Salah a worse head coach than Adam Gase? I think the in fact we're even asking this question speaks volumes about where we are right now. You know, the, the, can you can you have imagined when the Jets hired Salah if we'd ever be asked if he was worse than Gase? Um if you're asking like the actual answer to that, I think I'd still go with Gase. I think that with time, you tend to forget how bad things were with Gase. Uh, I don't agree that Gase never quit on the team. I mean, I, I, there were plenty of games where it felt like Gase quit to me. I think when Sam Darnold was out with Mono, if you listen to the way Gase talked, and if you've heard like some people who were in the locker room talk about that that time, it didn't sound like Gase really you know felt like it was his, his obligation to try and win games. Um, I think you know that you say they won seven games in 2019. Well, they started one and seven. They lost to an 0 and seven Dolphins team and an 0 11 Bengals team. They were out of the playoff race by like early October. And they yeah they they got a they ended up with a really soft schedule in the second half of that season. And they had some like narrow wins that made the record look better than it really was. But I think I think ultimately like if you're asking is Salah better than Gase, the, the place I'd go to is look at their special teams. I, I think I think I think the specialty is actually like something that's really important when you judge coaches. Robert Sala's specialties defense. Look, say what you will about Sala. His defense has always been, oh, have always been really good with the Jets. Gase's specialty was offense. His offenses were dreadful with the Jets. And how many guys left Gase and went on to be better elsewhere, including possibly Sam Darnold right now, who whose career just was, you know, went into a tailspin under Gase and now seems like he might finally be pulling it out, pulling it out of it. Um, so I think you have to go with Sala, but that's like the fact we're even asking this question speaks volumes about where we are. 
I, I think that it shows you that Salah really deserves to be under a, a under a microscope right now. It, it is it is not good right now. Next question. John, if I had one word to describe this coaching staff, it is delusional. I understand teams come out flat on occasion or have a bad game. After watching an Aaron Rodgers-led football team lose to Bo Nix and a bad Denver team that only had 60 yards passing, I was even more floored by Hackett and Salah's press conference. While I hate reading too much into press conferences, is it safe to say that Salah and Hackett are so disconnected from reality that they've lost this team completely? Well, I think it's difficult. I don't know whether they've lost the team completely. That was That is something we will see in the weeks ahead. I think that when you're a public figure and that's, you know, it's whether you're in sports or entertainment or politics or whatever, when you speak to the public, there needs to be a filter between your brain and your mouth because sometimes something you say can have residual consequences that you aren't counting on. So you need to think through how can this be perceived? You know, how, what's the worst possible way this can be perceived? Let me make sure I'm very careful with my words. I don't think Salah has that filter between his brain and his mouth because you listen to him at these press conferences. He just says things that, you know, are really tough to believe. I mean, they frequently make, he frequently says things that are obviously inaccurate. And I think like one of his things is he doesn't want to give the press anything to, to write about. So I think sometimes he, he just out and out is not truthful with the press. And that I think leads to the, percep the perception that he doesn't know what's going on with his own team. I think he just he thinks he's being cute. I think he thinks he's being clever. I think he thinks I'm not going to give the press any information. But there, there are ways of doing it. You know, Parcells was the master of this. Parcells was the master of you know dealing with the press because Parcells didn't give you anything useful. But you you walked away thinking Parcells is in control. Salad that gives you nothing useful, and you walk away thinking he has no idea what's going on with his football team. And there are also potential lingering impacts. I mean, look at the thing he said the other day with the cadence. If you missed it, uh, the Jets had five false starts in the game Sunday. So Salad started talking about. You know, do we need to simplify our cadences? Well, Aaron Rodgers hears this, and Aaron Rodgers seems annoyed. Aaron Rodgers goes, you know, we haven't had any issues with our cadences up to this point. We're four games into the season. He, said, he says, yeah, I guess we can scale back our cadences, but we can also start hold people accountable. Now, I'm not saying that, that, that there's a rift between Aaron Rodgers and Salah as a result, but it shows you that, you know, if you're not careful with your words, there could be some really negative residual impacts. I'm not saying that Rodgers and Salah are now butting heads. That's not my point. My point is that it can lead to something like that. You, you can... You can see that you, there's a clear path that could lead to some issues within the locker room like that. Um, and Salah, Salah's just, I, I don't want to, I, I like like the, the questioner said that you don't like to over interpret the comments the coach makes to the media. I agree with that because at the end of the day, winning games is what's most important. I think that when you win, anything you say comes off good. When you lose, anything you say comes off bad. I mean, if Adam Gase won games, that that press that opening press conference with the eyes, people would love it. People would talk about how he's this crazy football coach, and they love it. The reason the reason Adam Gase gets made fun of for the you know the press conference with the eyes where he was introduced is that he lost games, so people are frustrated. So anything you do becomes bad, and anything you do becomes a punchline. But yeah, I, I think that Salah comes off like frequently like a guy who doesn't know what's going on with his team. I do think he knows what's going on with his team. I just think he, I think his view is that he's being really cute with the media when instead he's just coming off like a guy who's completely detached from his football team. Now, had you on the Lockdown Jets podcast, we'll talk about a guy who's been a big part of the Jets the last two years, but you haven't really heard from much this season. What's up with Quinn and Williams? Let's try and explore that continuing here on this Wednesday mailbag edition of Lockdown Jets. Today's episode of Locked On Jets is brought to you by FanDuel. NFL fans, you can start the season with a big return on FanDuel, America's number one sports book. When you get a hunch in the middle of the game, you can check out the latest stats, view live play-by-play, -play, and so much more on the same page where you place your bets. And you'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. Of course, the Jets are heading to London this week. You know, sometimes when a team's coming off a really bad loss, it's good to get away from home, get away from the home, get away from your, your home fans, get away from the criticism. And, you know, maybe the team bonds. And that could especially be true in a trip to London. Well, the Jets are underdogs as they will face the undefeated Minnesota Vikings with our old friend Sam Darnold at quarterback. Vikings right now favored by two and a half points on FanDuel. If you think the Jets are going to bounce back, again, you should hear, hear about our deal. With a $5 bet, you get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Just go to FanDuel.com. It's America's number one sports book. Again, that's FanDuel, F-A-N-D-U-E-L.com. the Locked On Jets podcast on this Wednesday. We're doing our weekly mailbag show. Our next question, John, do you think Quinn and Williams has lost a step or is he being double teamed on every play? 
Uh, neither. I think he's off to a slow start. I think he's going to bounce back, though. He's a great player. Um, you know, he's beaten plenty of double teams the last two years. So I can't say that he's being double teamed on every play. That's why he's not producing as much. You know, last year, ESPN keeps track of this. They had him being double teamed on 70% of the snaps, 70% of the snaps he was playing. So, you know, I, I can't blame it on double teams. I, I don't know exactly what the issue is, but I, I think Quinn is going to bounce back. You know, uh, Quinn is not a guy I worry about because his game is so based on technique. So not that Quinn is even old, but the guys who would like depend on just being overwhelming athletes, sometimes they decline quicker than, than you would expect because the second their athleticism starts to go, they really start to struggle. Quinnen is a technician. You know, Quinnen knows, Quinnen essentially, you know, the expression pass rushing with a plan or attacking with a plan where he's got his first move and he knows like what the offensive line is going to do to try and combat that. So if the offensive line is successful, Quinnen's got a backup plan and Quinnen knows what the offensive line is going to do after that. So if that, that doesn't work, he's got a third plan. Uh, I think he's going to be fine. He's off to a slow start. Now, is the lack of talent having an issue there? Look, the Jets have issues on the defensive line right now. You know, like we talked about in the first segment, everyone's talking about Devontae Adams. I mean, there are actually like viable in-house solutions at wide receiver for the Jets right now. And that's why like, I don't think it's as urgent to trade for Devontae Adams as a lot of people do. Because I do think Garrett Wilson's going to get better and he's going to get better chemistry with Rodgers. Mike Williams, it's not just that I think Mike Williams is going to get healthier you're seeing it in real time happen that Mike Williams is getting healthier each week. Like Mike Williams is getting better and better each week. This is not just like me speculating. Mike Williams is continuing to improve every single game. The defensive line. I mean, look, you can debate. I know some Jets fans say, well, you know, Huff's awful in Philadelphia. Okay. Fair enough. Uh, people say, well, John Franklin Myers wasn't that good. Well, you weren't saying that while he was here, but okay. Um, you know, Quentin Jefferson, you know, the Jets don't miss him. But you can, you can argue that like fine it was fine to let these guys go, but the replacements these the Jets got for these guys have been completely ineffective this year. And is the lack of talent around him impacting Quinnen? I mean, maybe. I think Quinnen's got to play better. But I have bigger issues. I have bigger concerns with the defensive line because, you know, outside of Quinnen and Will McDonald, I don't know that there's a lot of pieces that are, are – being very helpful for this who even have the potential of being very helpful you know i see in-house solutions to fix the issues at wide receiver i don't know where the in-house solutions are on the defensive line you know quinnon's the only guy i trust and mcdonald and i trust mcdonald to get to the quarterback after that it's a very weak unit uh so i've got more kids i have i think quinnon will bounce back i don't think he's you know washed up i don't think he's lost a step i don't think it's about him being double teamed on every play i just think he's not playing as well as he has in the past but I I have bigger concerns about the rest of the line because I sometimes like we get used to we just get to the use used to the idea that the position group's really good and it kind of makes us realize slower than we should that when it declines. You know, we're used to the Jets defensive line being really good. So we I think we just took it as a given the Jets defensive line is always going to be good. Jets defensive line is not good right now. And I think that I don't know that there's an internal solution. Again, trade market, they ought to be looking at defensive line. You can you can look at Devontae Adams if you want. The real area where they need help is the defensive line right now, in my view. And our last question from Taylor. John, I know you're tired of talking about the Reddick situation, and we're all tired of thinking about it. Given how late it is now in the season, would it even be worth bringing back Reddick, given how long it will likely take him to get back into peak football shape? Would the Jets just be better off admitting the trade was a disaster and trading him for whatever they can get? No, I think that they need Reddick. Um, look, at the end of the day, you the day you sign Reddick, he's probably not going to play a full assortment of snaps that week. But I'm sure he's I'm sure he's keeping himself in shape. Now that's not football shape. You know, being in regular good shape is not the same as being in good football shape. But being in good regular shape means you could probably give him some snaps the first game. You know, it's it's not like he's playing safety where he's gonna have to make a lot of complex reads and you know, maybe you'll want to get him get him some get him ample practice time so that he's he's fully up to speed. Reddick's job is to get to the quarterback. So like that's not that's not a very complex thing. You could play him on some you maybe give maybe give him 10 to 15 snaps on obvious passing downs, let him get after the quarterback. I just told you, I mean, the Jets defensive line right now is a problem. And that might be, you know, we just talked about internal solutions. That's like the one thing that could happen that internally that could improve this, this group. You know, you could talk all you want about what message are you sending? You know, this is not youth football. This is not high school football. I understand that you have a guy acted like Reddick and was playing, you know, in high school. Maybe you would not let him back, but we're not in high school. We're not trying to teach lessons. This is the National Football League. The name of the game is winning. And if Reddick's willing to come back, and you know, at some point he is going to have to come back if he wants to be a free agent. Jets, the Jets need him. 
Jets need better pass rush. I mean, the, the pass rush has not been there the last couple of weeks. And again, Will McDonald's the only defensive line you can count on to get to the quarterback. So, you know, I know a lot of people don't want to hear this. A lot of people say, we don't need Raddick. You know, you, 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 you abandon us, get, get, get lost. We don't need you. Well, we do need you because it, we, we wouldn't have needed you if the, if the other guys were playing up to performance. If Jermaine Johnson doesn't get hurt. You know, if Quinton Williams is playing well, if Kinlaw was looking worth the money, fine. We wouldn't need Reddick. Guess what? I, I think the Jets have lost this gamble. Now, I don't think Reddick has come out come out ahead here either. Reddick's cost himself a lot of money. And uh, look, when you're going into a contract year, you want to have a big year. What gets you paid after a contract year is putting up a monster number. Holding out does not give you does not get you big money. So I don't think Reddick comes out of here as the winner either. I think this is a situation where nobody wins. I think Reddick has hurt himself. I think the Jets have hurt themselves by their approach to Reddick. I think this has been a situation that's been handled very poorly on all sides. And I don't, you know, neither side's going to salvage what they wanted out of this. Reddick's, you know, hurt his, Reddick's hurt his market value over the course of the, uh, as he heads into free agency. He's not going to get the big payday he wanted now. And the Jets, I mean, they've lost these games that where they were supposed to have this guy who was a star pass rusher. Um, if Reddick's willing to come back, you've got to take him. I, I don't see any other option. Now, the Jets lose a couple of games and fall out of the race, then that changes things. You know, if the Jets suddenly fall to two and four, two and five, that's the point where you just I think I think that's the point where you don't you don't just trade Reddick. I think that's the point where you become a seller at the deadline. You just trade off all your veterans in the final year of their contract, get what you can for them, and just begin, you know, the process of trying to retool. Anyway, that's all for today's episode. This has been the Locked On Jets podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day is our motto. If you enjoy the show, hit the subscribe button where you're watching or listening so that you'll never miss an episode. If you enjoy the show and you're listening on the podcast, course, please give it a five-star review. And if you're watching on YouTube and enjoy the show, give this episode a big thumbs up. It helps us out, helps other Jets fans find the podcast. Enjoy your Wednesday, everybody. We'll be back tomorrow to talk more Jets.